Yes, sir. Uh, regarding the uh, Chattanooga to Macon route, uh, which would certainly help them. Uh, what about uh, people from the Midwest, say, who just want to come to Atlanta? Is there any way to know how that would still affect the issue? Tourists that just want to go to Atlanta to see Atlanta or pass through Atlanta. They're going to Disney World, right? They're going to Disney World. But they want to go to Atlanta. They want to go through it. Yeah. They want to pass through it. All I can think is it would make it an easier trip for them. It would be that much more open highway for them to deal with. Is the main concern of trucks and trucking as far as the uh, interstate through Atlanta? Yeah, it's one, of, one of the things, we talk about 30 and 40 percent, from the numbers that we see, if you I showed you that map of the desire lines where you look at the whole country. It had some great stuff on just the north-south um, sections. If you blow that up into the country, our numbers are closer to 60% of the truck traffic that's involved with Atlanta is passing through. So, I mean, the answer is it's, it's even more significant when you blow that up into a national flow in and through Atlanta. 60% of the truck traffic just wants to get around Atlanta. Um, some of it is still going to come. Kind of thing I when I go somewhere I've never been, I like to go through the major and, and there may be some of that. And Roger, I don't know that anyone's tried to do the non-truck commerce, but I'm sure there's a lot of business travel as well that is forced to come through Atlanta that would be happy to bypass it if it could. Um, you know, and that, because that's part of it. You, you see the picture all the time. Anything on the interstate has got to end up in Atlanta. And you know. Well, and, and, and anecdotally, you hear people all the time, folks who, uh, who, who go to Florida for the winter and those kinds of things, you hear them all the time say, I schedule my trip in such a way that I can spend the night north of Atlanta or south of Atlanta so that I get Atlanta at 10, 11, 12 in, during the middle of the day when, frankly, traffic moves pretty good. Yep. Mm -hmm. but, I, but I don't want to ever schedule my trip to hit Atlanta at 7 or 8 in the morning or 3 or 4 or 5 in the afternoon. And so providing those people who don't want to come here for tourism an opportunity <coughs> to not come through Atlanta has to give us some minimal benefit and provide additional benefit to those people who do want to use 75 and 85 and 285. I think the key is we're giving people choices. Exactly. I think we get in trouble when we force things. I, I know, you know, Ed, it might have been truck only toll lanes, we're forcing trucks to, to pay a toll. They become a captive audience. But when people are making choices of their own free will, they can make decisions of what's best for them. If they want to go through and see the big buildings in Atlanta and stop and eat at the varsity, that's fine. But you know, if you're in a hurry, you, know, you might want to bypass Atlanta. I think those are valid. All right, first Bob and then Commissioner Oxendine. Yeah, let me make a point that two and a half years ago I presented to the Ed's organization at their summer conference. And that is this, that in my opinion, there is no more important industry than logistics in Georgia for all the reasons that have been outlined here. I would agree with that. And, <laughs> <laughs> if you look at the financial numbers, None stacks up to what you guys provide. Secondly, and I was saying this for two and a half years ago, this state has been sorely remiss for not having a statewide transportation plan. We haven't had it as a lot of parochial decisions to be made to the negative impact of all of us. Thirdly, in terms of the answer for Metropolitan Atlanta is as we're hearing today, and I, I think it's been said by all three panelists, the solution in great part is going to be by resolving the issues outside of Metro Atlanta. We just cannot continue to look to build ourselves out internally. So having said that, then, I would only caution everybody in one respect, and this is different. And that is this, that as we look to make these decisions, that we as a state don't remain parochial. You saw the national uh, inbound and outbound map that Paige provided. And some of the solutions that have been proposed in terms of resolving the problem outside the special area, every one of them is within this state. I think we need to look at it more regionally throughout the southeast as well as nationally. To that end, I would suggest to you, I mean, I could throw out an example of going from Memphis to Birmingham down to southeast Georgia that would benefit south Georgia as well. Uh, politically, I think that's more tenable. Two reasons why south Georgia legislators would like it, and our senators and representatives from the southeast United States would like it, so we wouldn't be fighting exactly what was stated earlier, Alabama and some of these decisions. But having said that, I hope that as we look at it from the ARC's perspective, the IT3 perspective, and the legislators' perspective, that we make our decisions from a regional United States perspective that will benefit this country as a whole. We do that, 
that Georgia is poised, I think, extremely well to serve as a solution for us and for the nation. Two, two things. One, um, on the planning side. Um, we heard loud and clear as we did this task force reporting, um, the industry wanted four things. One, um, the plan has to be, that we have to have a plan. What is our transportation plan? Use Home Depot, for example. They have a long-term plan. It's fundable. They're using it and they're driving their business around it. They need a state partner that's doing the same thing. That plan can't change every four years. That plan can't be subject to politics. It's got to be based on the data. It's got to be based on the facts and the figures. Um, the, there's got to be margins to change as the economy and as the situations change around logistics, but it's got to be a durable plan. That plan's got to be owned and it's got to be real. It can't just be blue sky ideas that'll never get funded. And we've, we've talked about how that's not going to help anyone. Um, so there's got to be funding and there's, we've got to figure out how to get money to pay for those, to pay for that plan. And then fourth, somebody's got to own it. Who delivers that plan? How does it get implemented? And that ties into the other ones. That, that would help get funding, that helped make it durable. Um, so those are things that have been recommendations for the freight and logistics task force that we did. I, I know personally that there are things that DOT and the legislation is working on putting together into a statewide transportation plan. IT3 is a piece of that. Um, and there's a variety of organizations that are involved in making that happen. It's exciting to me because that's never been done before. That comprehensive look um, has never been performed in Georgia before. Tied into that is this collaborative idea uh, that you talked about where it's not just Georgia. You saw the national pictures. Um, we're working with the I-95 corridor coalition, for example, to look at the East Coast and look at I-95. Georgia's doing some great things. The I-16 has put together a corridor a coalition of their own, um, working with Alabama and North Carolina and, and, and others to look at how freight is flowing and how they're going to connect. At the end of the day, the cargo doesn't care. Cargo doesn't care that it's, that it's in Georgia or North Carolina. It wants to get from point A to point B, and it wants to get there in the most efficient way possible. Um, it doesn't know state boundaries, it doesn't know county boundaries, and it doesn't know regional boundaries. So how do we make that into the mix? And those are things I can tell you from my perspective that are going on now into this new transportation plan. So it's coming. Mr. Knox, now. Um, kind of coming at it from an elected official standpoint, we've got a handful of us here in the room. The population base, if you look at the legislature, you know, you've got to have the Atlanta legislators on board because that's where most of them are from. I'm in Gwinnett County, uh, just like Sam. We both have a little bit of traffic in our towns. Um, the Cobb and Gwinnett and North Fulton are probably three of the worst. I think about it, how do you get people like in my community in Gwinnett to buy off on it? And <coughs> one is if you convince the Atlanta folks that listen, get the trucks off the road, get the snowbirds off the road, mm -hmm. get the Disney World and beach vacationers off the road. And when I say off the road, I'm talking the Atlanta roads. Maybe I can get from Gwinnett County to Cobb County, mm -hmm. which right now I can't. Mm -hmm. and, I, and if there's a way to market it that you can do that, I think at that time, people in Atlanta say, okay, it makes sense. It makes sense building these roads way outside of the Atlanta area because at least it lets me get within my where I want to go. The other thing that I think is also very appealing to people in Metro Atlanta, they do care about economic development in the state. They may not say we want to build a road in rural Georgia for the convenience of rural Georgia, but they care about the economic development. If if I was an executive in Cincinnati, Ohio, and had a corporate headquarters and a distribution center. And if I was thinking about going south with cheap labor, cheap land, good taxes to build a factory and send my stuff up to Cincinnati, if I was looking at South Georgia and South Alabama, I'd go to South Alabama mm -hmm. because it doesn't take a brain surgeon to say my truck leaves South Georgia, it goes to Atlanta. It leaves South Alabama, it goes through Montgomery or Birmingham. I mean, things like that, I think someone in a North Fulton, Gwinnett, Cobb, whatever, are going to say, well, that makes sense because that is economically good for the whole state. Mm -hmm. You're not taking money from my wealthier county around Atlanta and sending it to a county in South Georgia that needs economic assistance because you're building up their economy and they can stand. So, I'm just kind of trying to give you that elected official thing. I think those are two, two good ways to sell it to the voters, to the legislators in this area who obviously have got to buy into it. 
Well, yeah. if you, oh, right. I was just to say, if you'll allow me a, a fairly pedestrian analogy, um, quite simply, if you have clogged arteries, what's the doctor do? They give you a bypass, and you know, by bypassing, you get healthy again. That's the same for this region. Bypasses around this region would allow future growth and development in this region as much as it would elsewhere. Um, it gets you healthy again, so you can get from Gwinnett to Cobb, and you know, and, and things like that. Um, you know, to, to that first point of how do you explain the benefits to someone in the metro Atlanta area. I mean, I live in Cobb County, and I commuted down the, the same road with Sam, you know, and I, I don't get to drive a truck, I drive a car, so I want to get out of traffic just like everybody else. Um, and the idea of having that bypass is very attractive to me. You know, I put tourism in a different vein, similar to Roger. Uh, you know, Atlanta's a big tourism town, and, and we want to encourage a lot of that traffic to still come here for tourism, and we have great assets for that industry. But about 50% of our accidents, of our delays, are due to accidents. And, you know, the fact of the matter is when we go up to our residents, our residents weren't opposed to truck-only lanes. The truckers were. And I understand why the truckers were, and that's why we need to talk about things like we are today with bypasses. So I'm not discussing tolling, because I, I agree that, that that 10 years of litigation doesn't solve the damn problem. Let's move forward. But when you go up to your residence, uh, when there's a wreck between two cars on I-75, unless it's a fatality, uh, that wrecks to the side of the road. When there's a wreck involving a tractor trailer, put a fork in it, call your spouse, you're not going to be home any time soon. And that's the sales point from the elected officials to their residents. If we provide these bypasses to move the freight, we're then reducing the number of wrecks on our interstates involved in our uh, commute that get us home to our children faster. Uh, and I'm not discussing for a second who caused the wrecks, because I'm sure there's plenty of maniacs out there in single occupancy vehicles causing those tractor trailer wrecks. You know, every, everyone makes mistakes, everyone is foolish, we're human. But for every time you've got a tractor trailer hitting a little car, uh, I'm betting on the tractor trailer to have less personal injury. And if we could provide that bypass, we're going to make a huge dent on the, the commute times for our region. What? <clears throat> what happened to the Northern Arc solution that was fired in 2002? I used to read a lot about the Northern Arc, the 75, 85, or living in the Northern part of 285. Where's that gone? Well, the, 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 the political... <laughs> <laughs> okay, the... the, the <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the political answer is, is, is Governor Purdue disagreed with former Governor Barnes and, and the uh, project was killed. Now, whether or not it needs to have a new life or not will probably be the focus of the next governor in, in making that decision. But I would argue that what first needs to be done is a, a study analysis. Uh, Kelly said we don't need stu more studies. We do need a couple limited studies. If we do this bypass, is an outer loop necessary? And the truth is that shouldn't be a political decision. That should be a, a decision based on engineering. Right. Uh, if, we make the, if we do the fall line freeway, what effect does that have once again on the outer loop? So we do need some limited studies if we're going to do these bypasses, uh, not so far as whether these bypasses are appropriate, but as to what other projects are no longer needed. Uh, so that we're efficiently spending those monies. And it would seem to me that that's, that would be part of that analysis. Uh, if we're not trying to move traffic, to truck traffic from 85 to 75 and vice versa, based on this bypass, there may not be a need for that project. Don't forget the University of Georgia fans trying to get to Athens, though, on football day, game days. Mm -hmm. Our friends in Rome say it's, it's very difficult. <laughs> Chick. time that that northern part was proposed, first looked at as, a, as an outer belt line, right. the only piece of it that... <coughs> and essentially what we're talking about is, is the same bad, idea. But, but the point is that, that whether the data and, and that all those studies were done before, before my time here, because I guess that languished on the books for 20 years or more before it was finally killed. But, and I don't know whether, whether it was bad data or just changes um, in, in traffic patterns due largely to the port. But 
the, the thought was that an awful lot of the truck traffic was truck traffic coming down 75 and up 85, and that's why you needed that connector to, to again, get, get them out of, of, of Metro Atlanta. The current studies are showing that there's a lot more traffic going yeah. in these Fair other directions sense. and that this other bypass <coughs> seems to make more immediate sense. There is a study going on at GDOT as to whether or not um, a, another northern arc kind of project is necessary, but it would be further north than what we had looked at earlier because the other problem <coughs> that, that we were running into when Governor Barnes tried to resurrect the Northern Arc was that so much of the planned um, right of way had been used, had been had been permitted, and actually new homes and schools and churches and things <coughs> were in the were in the, 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 the right of way itself, and, and that was where a lot of the opposition was coming from. So if 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 that issue comes back up again, it's going to have to be something further north. Mm -hmm. Then you get into a lot of environmental problems the closer you get to the mountains. Um, That's a great point because, I mean, our leadership you know, was cognizant enough to, to do that long-term planning by that right-of-way. Um, like I think of you know, Gwinnett and Cobb County have had tremendous growth but done a great job of planning for that growth long-term, putting in utility systems, water and sewer systems, and, you know, it's one, one situation where we had planned ahead, but we didn't maintain the right of way. And then you got in a situation where you had neighborhoods and they didn't want it. Uh, Representative Graves. Ed, uh, I have a couple questions. I'm fascinated by the number of trucks that are traveling through the state and potentially not good business, but whether it's 30% or 60%, is there a number that, that it equates to in cars or vehicles? You know, just getting off of this. What would it be relieving? Well, d depending on whose measurements you want to look at, you can pick anywhere from three to six cars reasonably. Per truck? Per, per truck. If you take that truck off the road, there's space that would fit three to six cars, sometimes because cars follow much too closely. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, it, you are. You, you're, building a, you're bringing a lot of new capacity if the truck's <laughs> off of that road and onto a different road. Yeah, that's rather significant. And then uh, when the gas prices went up, and I'm being from northwest Georgia, so the border area, I imagine this happens in other border uh, interstate counties. We Historically, our gas prices, fuel prices, have been lower than Tennessee. And, but when the fuel prices went up and our sales tax kicked in and, and was multiplying by the mm -hmm. 4%, the truckers and the, and the, and the truck stops will tell you that the truckers began buying fuel in Tennessee and driving all the way to Georgia. Is there something we need to do with our tax code that Well, um, let me give you two short answers, because uh, if I give you the full answer, everybody will go to sleep. Um, the, the short answer is yes, there are things we should change about our tax code when, when it comes to taxing diesel fuel. Um, and the second short answer is we already capture that revenue from those trucks. Uh, trucks are not taxed in the same manner that cars are taxed. When you, when you and I drive a car, we pay the tax when we pump the gas. And if we don't buy any gas in a state, we don't pay any tax in that state. Truckers have to keep written records of every mile they travel in every state they travel through and then remit checks to that state if they don't buy any fuel in that state. So the trucks that are passing through Georgia make fuel tax payments to the state of Georgia whether they buy fuel tax or not. But Georgia's fuel tax is so convoluted and so Byzantine that it actually pays Georgia-based truckers to go across the state line and buy their fuel in Tennessee or Alabama or South Carolina rather than buy fuel in Georgia. So you've got those border convenience stores that are losing a lot of business. Um, and one way the state could actually bring in new revenue is, sim is to simplify the fuel tax that it puts on truckers, and only truckers. Doesn't have to do a thing with car fuel tax. Um, and, and it would actually reap new benefits without increasing the sales tax. So how do they do that? How do they go buy fuel in Tennessee at that one rate and remit a new, another tax in another state? Do they not see we have to. additional? We have to keep the tax rate for every state and the mileage for every state, do the calculation, turn it into the uh, IFTA department at the state of Georgia Department of Revenue, the International Fuel Tax Agreement, and then the state 
we send the state a check and the documentation saying we did 1,000 miles in Tennessee and 200 miles in Ohio. The state of Georgia then cuts the check to Ohio and to Tennessee. Meanwhile, Ohio and Tennessee are cutting checks to the state of Georgia from, their, from truckers based in those states that travel through the state of Georgia. Makes you want to be a trucker, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. So that is the pilot program for the VMT that we've been here. Well, the, yeah, and the VMT is something we don't ever want to... Not, not truckers, but I don't think the people ever want to get into having the state track everywhere they go, which is why truckers do it now and drivers don't. One question up here. You got a question? Yes, sir. You talked about U.S. 27 being capable of for this track now. Has any study been done on how long this project would take from Chattanooga to Macon and what the price tag might be? Hey. The IT3 has some of that stuff built into it as far as what, what would be the, their, their, their big guesses at what costs would be and what the impact would be. So. That, and frankly, that's part of what I was referencing earlier about needing some more analysis. But, yeah. but we do know, for instance, let, let me give you this, and Chick will disagree, will, will disagree <laughs> if I'm wrong. I, I believe that the downtown connector is the second most congested roadway in our region, correct? Uh, but it, it, no one really wants to pay for another bridge to double deck the downtown connector. So as you look at the analysis, it's, it's not so simple as simply what, what are our most congested roads and, and then let's solve them. To the extent we can reduce congestion on additional, on other roads, excuse me, by, to the extent we can reduce congestion on existing roads by paying for projects elsewhere that will then be the feeders for that congestion, it's far cheaper than doing it in Metro Atlanta. You know, once again, on 27, et cetera, you'll have to buy right-of-way. You'll have areas where it's brand new road, but that right-of-way isn't going to cost what it does in Metro Atlanta. So if we acknowledge we need to have new road projects either way, it's far easier to say, okay, what's our right-of-way cost? The asphalt's the same, but what's the right-of-way cost? And it's, there's a huge difference. You know, you're, you're changing zeros. Yeah. Uh, actually, it's still in place. It, sti it still works. Oh, no, they do, and, and we still get fined for it. Um, but you do need to realize that there's an awful lot of logistics located within 285. There are actually a lot of trucks that need to be inside the perimeter because the warehousing is located inside the perimeter. But it, it actually is still in place. So is, so is there more, in, proportionately more inside now than there was in those days? Oh, yeah, there's been a lot of growth for the companies inside the perimeter. Yes, sir. I think somebody threw out a number, 60, some, somewhere close to 60% of the state uh, sales tax is generated in Atlanta. That kind of means to me that other than the goods that are produced in Atlanta, they're still going to have to come in to Atlanta by truck. So about 60% of the, the, uh, the trucks in the state are going to have to still come into Atlanta and be able to deliver those goods to be sold. And uh, so... That means that kind of means to me that we're dealing with about 40% of the, of the trucks left that we could bypass. And what impact does like the LTL business or the, as you just mentioned, Ed, the distribution terminals that are currently, you know, within the city, that those trucks are still going to come into the city, like uh, ours, I'm with UPS, our trucks will still come into the city just because we need to, it's a natural hub location uh, geographically within the southeast. Even if you look at Page's uh, national distribution map, you see freight coming in from the west and then heading up to the north. It's you know, it seems like it's still always going to be a distribution point. So are we really dealing with the you know, 33 percent of the trucks? Well, actually, it was Chairman Olin's number. That, um, so, but it's your question. But it, uh, yes, well, so we'll I'm, I'm going to help him out then. Um, the, the, the short answer is that, that it's not really 60% of sales doesn't equate to 60% of the trucks because right. you've got to include the through trucks that are in that traffic as well, where they're not bringing anything in. Right. 
Um, so I yeah, I mean, if you look yeah. at it, there's a lot of empty trucks that are moving around and, and a variety of yeah. And then I think there's also a differentiation between small package delivery and retail home delivery and, and large, you know, 18 wheelers with, yeah. you know, containers and, and 53 foot trailers in the back. And given, uh, there's a little bit different there too. Given grocery stores, shopping malls, and everybody that lives in the metro Atlanta area, there's always going to be trucks on the road in the metro Atlanta area to keep, keep the store shelves yeah. full. Um, I think what we're all talking yeah. about here is, is a secondary distribution, the opportunity to open up other distribution points south of Atlanta that can then feed other areas as well and, and feed growth in other parts of Georgia. The other thing to think about is the sales tax is applied to retail goods only, not business to business transactions. And so you've got a lot of all the heavy bulk goods that are moved that aren't paying sales tax. So that might skew those figures a little bit too. Jake? There, there were two, been two studies done on, on freight logistics in Metro Atlanta in the last year. Ed, mm -hmm. you worked with us on the ARC study. That was the good one. We found, yeah. <laughs> we, we found about, we, we found about 40% of the trucks on, on Metro Atlanta's highways had no origin or destination. Mm -hmm. GDOT has done one, and I think their number is a little higher. But I, I think people are pretty comfortable with the idea that, that it's somewhere around 40% of the trucks could be diverted out of Metro Atlanta if they have a reasonable alternative route to tech. And, and, and the, the big issue in my mind is, is getting the state to make a commitment to that alternative to engineering it, to designing it, engineering it, funding it, and getting it moving forward so that it doesn't become another Northern Arc mm -hmm. and that it, 20 years later was a good idea that never got off the ground. We've got some momentum behind these ideas today and, and when you've got you know, the, the, a, a lot of different organizations, whether it's, whether it's this organization or whether it's ARC, supporting these kinds of investments outside of metropolitan Atlanta. It's not, you know, it's not our job to, to design um, transportation infrastructure outside of metro Atlanta, but, but these are good ideas and they need to be, there needs to be a commitment made at the state level to advance them as quickly as possible and put them in place because we don't really have the opportunity for significant new capacity in metro Atlanta. And that's just a fact. I think you've got the 40% of the through traffic, but you've also got that other 30%, I think, in the medium to long term, you could peel off maybe 10 or 15% of that by adding new distribution mm -hmm. capacity in middle Georgia for, to address all that growth, where mm -hmm. they wouldn't have to come to the distribution center in Atlanta because they also have one in, in, in Macon. So I think there is a, a little bit more than maybe the 40, but you know, I think 40 is nothing to sneeze at. One, one more question. Right here, you got your hand up first. Personally, I think that's an excellent question, um, and, I, and I would hope, we weren't real specific here, but I would hope the planning process would have the foresight to go outside of Macon, perhaps right. south of it, right. you know, to some nice greenfield area, right. rather than right through the heart of Macon, right. like we did in Atlanta. Right. Yeah, when we referenced Macon, we weren't referencing the city limits. The area. We're yeah. referencing the area, and, and frankly, near Warner Robins, right. may have a lot of opportunity. That's absolutely correct. We have, still got more over time. Get yours in. Um, probably not the most popular question. Um, Atlanta's rapidly becoming known uh, as the uh, transportation study capital of the world. And um, one, of the, one of the problems seems uh, consistently to be uh, we have too many opportunities of, of, of improvements we could make. Um, and some of them are local within Atlanta. Some of them are statewide, strategically statewide. Um, and, and, and Chair Rollins uh, uh, indicated that uh, we, we have the challenge right now of coming up with uh, uh, practical, doable solutions that, uh, that we can then, you know, put pencil to paper and figure out, okay, how are we going to fund these practical, doable solutions that happen to be the top priority, most effective things that we can 
uh, possibly come up with. And then he takes that challenge and points it to the state legislators and says, these are the guys that have to solve that. And, I, and I'm just wondering, is that putting the problem in the hands of the right people, uh, as opposed to taking the, the people that are you know, closer to the information, such as uh, Georgia Motor Freight or Logistics and combined with Georgia Transportation, uh, DOT, uh, combined with, you know, possibly some other entities that have uh, uh, interest in, uh, in uh, traffic, traffic flow and safety and management. Uh, <coughs> and then go back to the legislator and say, okay, here's what we decided we want to do. We think this is the best thing to do for Georgia, and here's why, and here's what we think it's going to cost. Now, find us some money for it. And, well, and I'm just wondering, if we aren't kind of going to the legislature a little bit early, in, in, in yeah, the okay, let, uh, let, let me uh, remind you of actually what I said on one issue and then respond to your question. I didn't say go to the legislature. I said go to the legislature and GDOT. I specifically said both at the same time for different reasons. You'll also recall that I said money isn't the solution to all problems. You've got to deal with project delivery. Now, it seems to me that, I mean, for instance, we don't even have the money now to do the projects we know need to be done now on the books without including projects like bypasses. Okay, so when we're, when we're asked to remove $888 million from the short-term plan now, and we just removed $4.3 billion a year ago, we're really past the point of do we have a financial problem. But you have to, at the same time, get to the project delivery issue, which in my opinion, there's been too little talk in that regard. Now by definition, from my perspective, when you're saying going up to GDOT, GDOT's gonna be working with Ed's group. I'm not assuming that we all have separate houses and we don't talk to each other. And frankly, the talking's happening, the doing isn't. We, we talk all, just like we got plans, we got talk. <laughs> what we need is dirt moving in our state. So we need the state legislature to not only provide the funding, but I think it's also fair game for the state leg legislature to demand that all of us do a hell of a lot better job than we've done before. And by that, I'm overtly talking about project delivery, among other things. So when the state legislature a year ago, Tom, I think said, we want a state transportation plan coming out of GDOT, God love them for doing it. It needed to be done. I'm not suggesting that you treat GDOT and the legislature as two different entities. I'm suggesting that they ought to be working far closer than they have worked previously in, in that process, along with clearly dealing with Ed's group, dealing with Page's group, et cetera. So I'm not into the silo mentality. But we have to understand that we don't have the money to do the prioritized projects on the books now let alone discussing projects like US 27, Fall Line Freeway, uh, et cetera. So it, it's not a either or, it's a both situation that we're in and, and y'all can clearly jump in here too. Well, I, I put that slide up about that common strong voice. I mean, and that's happening. I can tell you just from agency's point of view, from, from Greta to CERTA to DOT, the Department of Community Affairs to the list goes on and on, Department of Economic Development, Department of Labor, I got a meeting later on with all those groups, literally, to talk about transportation planning, to talk about some of the things that, that need to be done and need to be continuously collaborated on. Um, that's new. That's not easy to do in state government. That's not easy to do in general with people. Um, but it's happening, and it's exciting. Again, I think I said it a few times. Um, but Sam's right. It's, it's not all about funding. Um, the legislature does need to help us get funding for some of those projects, um, but it, it takes more than them as well. Um, it takes federal as, uh, in, the, in some instances as well, too. So. Um, but it, we're getting there. We're getting there. Well, let me just comment as an aside, when you say federal, you know, there's a lot of talk in D.C. now about increasing the federal gas tax. I, for one, am not jumping in that direction because we're a donor state. So if they increase the federal gas tax, you know, and people can fight over whether, whether we get 87 cents on the dollar or 92, I don't really give a damn which number. It ought to be 100. So I frankly would much rather have less discussion at the federal level about increasing the gas tax and more discussion about it coming from Georgia where you get 100 cents back on the penny, excuse me, back on the dollar, uh, because the, this idea of Congress increasing at a dime or 20 cents, whether there's a recession or not, if they don't guarantee 100 cents back on the dollar, uh, they, they got too much of my tax money now. Well said. 
Well, thank you all very much for taking your time out on a Friday morning before the legislature starts to our panelists and to everyone that was here. Uh, I think as a great ending question, is the purpose, what we're trying to accomplish here is a unifying vision so that we can agree on something and, and, and start, start moving forward because we've talked about it for a long time. Uh, thanks again, and uh, if you have any ideas that weren't able to be mentioned, please send them to us, and then we'll throw those ideas out. Paige, you got one Just more announcement. One. I live in Savannah, and I don't want to carry these things home, so if you're interested more about some of the technology-related stuff that's going on in logistics, I've got some folders over here that tells about what we do as an agency as, as far as some of the innovative things that's going on in logistics in Georgia. So, Thank you. We're plug. adjourned. Thank you.